So we all know what this is, uh, the dashboard of a, of a car. Uh, 400 sensors feed the information to an average car for real-time information telling us what the car is doing. We take it for granted. Yet, uh, a family member of mine had a heart attack uh, a few years ago, and I was shocked when I watched the process of what that individual went through, the, the complete lack of useful information in real time that was available for treatment to happen. And so that got me thinking, uh, why do we have all of this information for a car, yet when it comes to us with, with our, our health, uh, there's very little in real time or next to none. There must be a better way. So on the topic of heart attacks, it's a, it's a massive problem. It's one of many. Uh, so there are about 18 million deaths per year due to heart attacks. And it's a very shocking uh, condition in many ways. Uh, one of the reasons why it's a problem is that it, you can have no notice and you could drop dead from a heart attack just walking on the street as one example. And what's sad about that is that in many ways the problem is addressable. In its simplest form, the treatment for a heart attack can be as simple as taking, taking an aspirin. If only you had the notice uh, to provide the intervention. So that led us to think about this in a little bit more depth. Now, the concept of medicine, of course, the overarching principle is the right medicine at the right place and at the right time. And there is much to celebrate about what has taken place in medicine. We've seen some of that today. So think about uh, vaccines as, as one example and how that's changed the course of human history. And there's others, antibiotics. We've heard today about CAR T cell therapies and the impact that's creating uh, in better treatment for, for cancer. So that's the right medicine and that's ongoing. The right place, again, that's an endeavor that's a bit younger. It's around 50 years or so in terms of genuine scientific effort. Uh, so that includes, of course, pills, and, uh, but also patches and other areas like that. But the right time, well, that's almost been the laggard. Uh, so, and it's not because we haven't been trying, it's because the information hasn't been available, the tools haven't been available for us to try and find and define those kinetics until about now. So how is the information currently gathered uh, for most of our interventions? Well, the main way this is done is a technique that was pioneered in the 1940s, which is taking a blood draw, sending it to a pathology lab, uh, quite often an expensive pathology lab, and then waiting some time before getting a result back. Now, it can be effective in many different situations, this is true, yet, Let's consider a, a couple of its attributes. The first is, of course, it's a needle-based approach, but uh, it's resource intensive. So we need a lot of resource in order to do this. So that's one issue, so it's not for everyone. But even when it does take place, the information comes back much later in time. And sadly, there are some situations where it's too late for the appropriate intervention to happen. Uh, sadly, people die. Let's flash forward to the, the last decade. Uh, there's been an explosion of today's wearables, uh, which are mostly lifestyle uh, style devices, uh, steps, uh, et cetera, those, those sorts of things, heart rate. And one of the reasons why they're not used for high-end medical purposes is because of the amazing function of the skin. Now, the skin is a great barrier. We're all alive today because it's doing its job, it's keeping the bad stuff out and the good stuff in. When it comes to today's surface-based wearables, it's it's blocking the ability to sense uh, the key information which resides just under uh, the skin. But what is happening in this space? This is a, a great example of what's happening right now and has been happening in the last few years. This is continuous glucose monitoring devices, and my hunch is that there's probably some people in the room today that are wearing uh, some of these, and I've just seen a, a flinch of a hand uh, there to acknowledge that. Uh, so. How do they work? They're a wearable, but there's, there's a needle in that wearable, quite often a five millimeter needle. Sounds big, but it's, it's doing its job. And it measures your glucose levels. Now, for people that have type one diabetes, this is a complete game changer. It's completely changed the way they can manage their lives, and indeed, uh, it's, 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 it's just been fantastic. Now, that's been used millions of times and will continue to grow, but you could call this a, the first marker of significance for wearables for precision medicine. But there's a lot more to come. And let me just walk you through a, a couple of examples uh, of this. So I took a look at uh, that particular approach and I thought about 
how big those needles are and the downsides associated with that. And I thought, well, maybe the, the next step is minimally invasive wearables where you can gain access to those signals but without uh, all of the issues associated with, with a needle. So this is where some of my, my background and, and domain knowledge uh, came in. So I'm a biomedical engineer and for the last 25 years I've been working with the skin in many different ways with functional devices. As one example, uh, there's a patch that I've invented called a nano patch for needle-free vaccine delivery and that's going forward in many different ways in clinical trials and indeed uh, the very first work that we did for uh, the developing world uh, was sponsored by Rolex for uh, where I went to Papua New Guinea and that's, that's going forward in many different ways. So using that domain knowledge, I turned my mind to this particular problem. And so this is the one embodiment that we're working on as a solution with my team at uh, We're Optimo and the Australian National University. So on the right hand side, what we see is a very, very small array of microelectrodes that just reach a hair's width into the skin and by doing that, just go far enough to reach the signals that matter, but do it in a minimally invasive and a continuous way. And so that's the core principle of our particular approach, which is a micro wearable, but that's just one of many that are moving along uh, in this space of minimally invasive wearables. So I'm going to do a live demonstration uh, today, and uh, I thought about this, and I thought I don't want to uh, participate in a heart attack. Uh, so instead, uh, what I decided to do was uh, work, uh, do a demonstration of something else as an example. So this is uh, one of our, our micro-wearable uh, sensors. Now, I should stress this is a, a prototype. This is not a product. There is much product development to be done. Uh, so I need to manage expectations, but, but still, it's going well and going strong. Now, the particular test case that I'm, I'm going to show today is, as I mentioned, it's not heart attacks. I'm not intending to do that today, but uh, it's hydration. So it's continuous, continuous monitoring of hydration. Now, hydration is a big issue. In short, as we dehydrate, our brain shrinks, and you might not be surprised to hear that as our brain shrinks, that leads to a, a drop in our brain function. And there's many areas where that creates massive problems, and the way that hydration is currently monitored is, is quite poor. So this is an example, I'll take a readout. And what we have here is a real-time readout of my hydration level. And what we've done there is the thing that you can't see, of course, is what's under the skin. So we've monitored a key layer, just the hairs within the skin that's the most sensitive to hydration. So it's a real functional readout of hydration. As I said before, there's much work to be done. But this is what you would see if you took a slice of my skin and, uh, and looked at it under a microscope. So this is real data of our structures just going that outer layer of the skin where the, the signals are that matter the most. Now, if I turn my attention back to the heart attack example, uh, this is our approach in doing that. So again, the micro wearable goes into the skin, but what we do here is, is there's a protein that's released when a heart attack takes place. As heart tissue dies, there's a protein that goes into the blood, it's called troponin, and it's one of many uh, chemicals that are released into the blood. So that moves around uh, within the skin as well. Now, the way we detect that is we put a chemistry on the surface of these projections, and it's a type of aptima chemistry. Now, I won't go into aptima chemistry 101 today, but I will say the best way to think of it is a type of Lego that only clicks for that particular protein and that protein only. And when that clicking takes place, it leads to a signal uh, that's generated. And this is real data that's generated by my team. And here what we're doing is we're measuring troponin, not in the live animal, but in, on a bench setting, but simulating a particular heart attack, and it's showing the rise in troponin through a heart attack setting. And it has the specificity and the sensitivity that's of clinical relevance for the detection of a heart attack in real time. So we're very excited about this particular data. Now, if I take a step back and talk about the field in general, so wearables and precision medicine, it's moving at a great speed, and this kind of work is new, and just like any new endeavour, there's many challenges that we need to overcome, and here are just a few of those. Uh, so the first is technical. Uh, we're doing something that hasn't been done before, and what goes with that is challenges that need to be overcome. Also, we're stressing uh, some boundaries of regulatory authorities, like how do they deal with this? Is it a medical device? Is it a health tech device? How do we move with that? So that's the challenge that we're working with the regulatory authorities on. Uh, 
And of course, the data that's generated. How is that done securely? How do we maintain trust uh, with the particular patients and the consumers? These are all important challenges. But if I wrap up, uh, so this is the picture that I'd like to see uh, in, in the future, where we're functional, we're alive, and we're well. And I'm convinced that wearables and precision medicine, we're only just seeing the beginning of what's taking place uh, within this space. As part of that, within just a handful of years, there will be minimally invasive wearable sensors that will have the ability to detect uh, key biomarkers that matter in real time. Now, that's a real step change forward in how medicine uh, will get done in that endeavor of the right medicine at the right place at the right time, but also now in real time. And so if we go back to the heart attack, so that should open up a scenario where heart attacks will become rare, but it's not just heart attacks, there's other key treatments that have been difficult to uh, administer or do. We, we'll, it'll take that to another level. And it'll be about time. Thank you.